we're moving that to host our next uh, speaker, uh, uh, Rani Mitra. So I'm really glad to have uh, Rani on stage uh, because uh, Rani has clearly ha was at the first API days in 2012. That's true. Right? So, uh, yeah. Uh, and let's say his uh, mindset and his uh, knowledge uh, with some others, but uh, really where are the pillars of the industry, right? About where, uh, yeah, and his humility too, right? But, but yeah, so really advocating a good use of APIs of microservices over these years. And uh, and yes, yeah, so really glad to have you here, Ronnie. I know the effort it was to make that talk, right? But thank yeah. you very much for uh, for this. And so you have 25 minutes and the stage is yours uh, uh, for your talk uh, about going borderless uh, with uh, APIs. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, we're really glad to have you. All right. Let me just find the button like every single speaker has had to. One second. Application window. All right. Can I can I assume that you can see that? Yeah, I'm going to. Mehdi, just jump in if, if we can't. Uh, as with every Abby Days event, uh, I agree to do a talk. And then Mehdi says, what's the talk about? And uh, I say, I don't know, and then I come up with the title and eventually I have to come up with a talk to go with it. And this year, uh, I thought, you know, there's, there's this thing that has been an itch that I've been scratching, which is kind of a shift in the way we, we look at strategy. Uh, so I've called this going borderless, and we'll dive into what that means in a second. Uh, first, I just want to introduce myself a little bit better in case, you know, we've never met. Uh, so I'm Ronnie. Uh, I've been lucky enough to write a few books, and I'm really excited about this book. I'm working on this with Arakli. It's called Microservices Up and Running. Uh, I'm excited not just about the, the animal, which is a fantastic animal to get from O'Reilly. Uh, the first book I ever did for them, we got a snail. This is a huge, huge step up from that. Uh, but I'm excited about this one because it's really practical. Uh, it takes you from the point of if you don't have a microservices architecture, you go through the book, and by the end of it, you've built a, a complete thing, at least one. So you'll be able to say, hey, yeah, I've built, I've built one of these. The talk today, though, there's aspects of microservices in it. But, but I really wanted to address you know, a point of view, something I'm seeing in terms of us and how we look at APIs and, and API strategy. Um, and a lot of it comes from, you know, over the last year and a little bit, I've been working for this, this fantastic company, Publicis Sapient, uh, as a consultant. So Publicis Sapient is a, is a digital agency. We do digital transformation. Uh, I've been working with a lot of, of big banks. And we're starting to see kind of a change in how businesses are operating and how they perceive APIs and where maybe the next opportunity is. You know, Mehdi mentioned I was at the first API event. Um, and I've been in this stuff for a long time, it feels like. Right? Going back, even predating SOAP, I think a lot of was happening. And, and if you think back to that time, you know, in the early 2000s when you had SOAP start to emerge, there was a, a, an optimism about using the web. Right? So we would develop web services. They would be SOAP-based. Uh, but it would give us the ability to use this web that we had been using as humans to look at documents, to browse, uh, in a way that you know we wouldn't just have an email client in the browser, but we'd be able to make our software talk to each other. And so we got those standards, those those highly typed standards from from Microsoft and Dave Weiner, and eventually IBM getting involved. And they also did things like implement UDDI registries, right? They gave us ways of describing services, of finding services in an automated way. But really, if you look at it, what ended up happening, the real impact was we got APIs inside of enterprises and inside of companies. And that was a huge, huge step forward. Uh, it meant that we could start to take our business functions and wrap them up and you could invoke them. And we all started doing that. And then somewhere around the 2010s, uh, someone started calling these things web APIs, or at least that's around when I heard about it. And it was so confusing because I thought APIs meant something, and now I was being told APIs meant something else. But the crux of it was that it, it was an embracing of the, the, the DNA of the web, right? The, the protocol that made it work, HTTP. 
So whereas before, if you were making a SOAP interface, you were agnostic of the web. You could send a SOAP message over email. Now you were saying, no, no, this is about HTTP, and we're going to use HTTP to help software talk to software. Again, there was this, uh, this optimism about how we could use the web. If you actually look at the agenda of the, the first Paris Appy Days, which, uh, by the way, was in person, people gathered in a, in a physical room for that one, uh, you'll see that a lot of the talks were about openness. Uh, there was this optimism about the democracy of APIs that you know companies could start building these things and publishing them, and we could build interesting and engaging applications on top of it. Uh, it's around that time that a lot of people, you know, including myself, we were going around and telling companies that there was this opportunity here that you could take advantage of, that maybe your data is very valuable or you can become an API business because it turns out there's an economy and you can make this thing and find a new revenue stream. And all you have to do is uh, publish an API in the right way as a product. It kind of died down though. And the way it died down was we had companies who were championing this idea of public and open APIs, and they started to claw back. Uh, the companies that told us that uh, there was all this innovation potential and you could just release an API started making their APIs private or partner-oriented. Uh, the large enterprises who started building APIs, uh, it started to look like it was more of an experiment than a strategy. But we ended up with more APIs. And I say the biggest result, the biggest thing that came out of this era was suddenly developers mattered, right? We take that for granted now. But if you look at this era, at the beginning of this era, no one was really talking about them in the same way. But now we say developer experience in DX, like it's a term we've always used, right? The truth is before it was just a bunch of people in Microsoft when they were developing IDEs saying DX. So developers got a seat at the table. And now anything we're building, we're talking about developers. If you go in a room and talk to business people, they're talking about developers, a fundamental shift. And now we're in this era of microservices. And the microservices era is a bit different because it's this, this, this time where we're focusing on optimization. If you look at what the architecture is, it's taking a lot of what works on the web at scale and applying it inside. And the companies we emulate are the huge ones, the mega companies, you know, the Googles, the Amazons, who have so much tech and so much breadth and so many people on working on so many things, and they can do it at great speed, but with this massive power and base. So that's where we are. What's interesting to me, though, is this is a very API-centric view of what's happened. But if you take that lens away, um, if we stop focusing on the APIs, if not everything's about APIs, what we find out is that you know there has been all this stuff happening. Uh, here's a statistic I pulled up uh, just today: fifteen thousand SaaS companies in the world. Now I can't speak to the truthfulness of this stat, but it's a big number. There's a lot of people who have been building software and putting it on the web, right? Now what they haven't done is focused on putting APIs on the web, but what they built are companies that operate on the web. These are products. The other interesting thing that's happened is the value of APIs has gone down. Here's what I mean by that. Uh, in the early 2000s, if you publish software on the web, people might get excited about it. The fact that you provided an API and I can make a call from my software to call yours was a pretty unique and interesting thing. Uh, a lot of companies were doing it. They were doing it with XML and they were doing it with SOAP and it was a really cool feature. When we get to the 2010s and we're talking a lot more about APIs and why they're important, APIs start to become a, a utility function, a, a thing you should have. And when I'm evaluating what software I'm going to use, if you have an API, I appreciate that. And I might value you a little bit more than your competitors. So it starts to become a, a linear function, something that you're not going to surprise me. I'm not delighted or excited that you have it, but I'm interested. Uh, and I would say now we're at this point where uh, you better have an API. 
right? If you're going to put a product on the web and operate as a SaaS company, I assume you have an API. And in fact, if you don't, then I'm going to score points against you. So we have this combination of a massive amount of SaaS, most of it API enabled because APIs have become hygiene which means this, this world we were talking about kind of exists, right? There is a network of services available, but what it's not is a network of APIs, right? It's not about me going to an API catalog or API registry and finding this thing. It's not about speaking to developers. These are business products for business people that are API enabled. The API isn't the value, the API is the channel, but that doesn't mean it's not valuable. Right. We've been starting to increase our dependencies over time. And this is another reason the timing seems right for maybe a shift in where we invest and how we look at things. Right? We've been giving away more and more of our stack. Uh, if you're a business, you want to focus on your core capabilities, like Eric Evans talks about in DDD. Focus on the things that give you advantage. What are your differentiators? If you're Dropbox, you probably don't give away your storage capabilities right, to a cloud provider. If you're a bank, you probably don't care as much about optimizing how you run virtual machines. And so we've started to become more dependent on vendors to do these things. And a natural next step is to start to increase our dependence on capability providers, right? This makes sense. If I can focus on my core capabilities and I can use really good software around it, Maybe I can move faster, release better software, release better products, and improve experiences. And that's kind of what I mean by borderless. If you, if you started to build systems, assuming you had access to all that software, because I know we do use external services today, but what if you designed your solutions this way? If I just assume that I'm always going to use other people's services outside of my core domain, what would your architecture look like? What would your business look like? How would you run it differently? And how would you change how you compete? This is starting to become a new normal, right? How do you start to do less, but provide more by increasing what you depend on? So another way to say this is, you know, we went around and we've been talking about how building APIs is really the key to strategy. And it still is in a lot of ways. There's plenty of opportunity if you build APIs. But it might be that now is the time to focus more on the consumption. What would happen if you embraced a borderless, a borderless mindset uh, and became better at consuming? So it's not just about I can consume APIs. The competitive advantage comes from doing it better than anyone else turns out that that's hard. And that's why there's opportunity. Connecting to one API is, is almost trivial, right? And if it wasn't almost trivial, then what have the last like 10 years been about? Because that's what it was. We're going to make it easier. We're going to be developer-centric. We're focusing on usability. But what it's not is, is compounding or scalable. So if I write code, if I build a system to depend on one API, it doesn't help me connect to any other APIs. There's a lot of things like that in our industry and in our time in technology at the moment when it comes to connectivity. If you look at the history of talks now, Happy Days has been going for a long time. There's a lot of people at these events talking about how to solve this kind of problem, right? How do we make the system more charitable for dependencies? How do we make it so that loose coupling is more of a thing? For whatever reason, you know, the market isn't really listening. No one is getting an advantage by being more interchangeable. So the only way to really take advantage of this is to take on some of that cost yourself, right? So the opportunity is we have a, we have a, world where APIs are, are a little bit brittle, a little bit coupled, what can you do to build a system where you can leverage all that capability and do it in a way where the real advantage comes from swapping in parts in and out? Well, it turns out you have to address some specific challenges. 
the first thing is engagement. What we don't have is a world where I can, through machines or through algorithms, pick capabilities I want to use, determine costs, and onboard and engage. That doesn't really exist. There's versions of that world that people have described, but it's not here yet. So what you need to do if you want to be borderless is really strengthen your human capability. here. You need to assess the market. You need to have a map of the ecosystem. You need to know who the players are. You need to have strong contract and procurement functions. The good news is most of us do if we're operating an enterprise. But there's a nuance here. If you go to a procurement person and you tell them about this idea, you say, what we want to do is actually start engaging with a host of partners. There's 15 of them. And we think these 15 partners are going to lead us into a future where we're more profitable. The response you're going to get is, you know, is there some way we could just engage with one of them? And that one partner could pick the other 14. Because from a commercial perspective, this is very difficult. There's a lot of risk. There's a lot of liability. It's a lot of work. So just like we do when we build a technology system, we need to make this easier from an integration perspective and from an interop perspective. So the goal here, when you're thinking about engagement with the outside world and capabilities, is how can you bound these relationships? So you can tell your procurement teams and your buying teams and your partner teams, each engagement is its own thing. And when we change the function or we switch suppliers over here, we're going to encapsulate that impact so that you don't have to change. And if this sounds familiar, it should, right? It's the same kind of reasoning we talk about for microservices. I think there was a guy who made a law about communication and systems or something like that. The other thing we have to accept and address is that we can't change someone else's API. So I'm using all of these services. And again, what they're selling is val a value, a capability, what they're not selling me is an API. So their APIs may not be as modern or as loosely coupled or in the style that I want. So we're going to have to protect ourselves. We're going to have to invest in capability to create the loose coupling we want, to create the system that we want. And here, we can adopt a lot of the stuff that works within a microservices system. I can start to abstract an API. Essentially, I can take your API if you're a capability provider and create a version of it that works for me and translate between the two. Right In the domain-driven design world, you might call that an anti-corruption layer, where we've identified these are the subdomains. And you know, in order to protect our domain model and our data model, we're going to put something in between us. The trick here is to figure out what those boundaries are. So understanding your core domain, understanding what the subdomains are, turns out to be important because this is how you bound your change. Right? When the capability provider's model changes, you're going to have to change one of these anti-corruption layer components. Which ones? The other thing you'll need to do is introduce some kind of operations and testing capability just like you would for your own services, so that you understand when external things are changing, but you treat them like they're internal. So you build all of that visibility and observability and change management right into it. The other problem you'll hit is that by design, we don't want the providers talking to each other, because that's going to make our relationships more difficult. It will just make our world more complicated. So instead, we're going to have to pay that cost. It means that we need to start building a choreography layer or an orchestration layer or something that weaves the whole thing together. And there's lots of different ways to implement that. Uh, the big decision here is, are you going to decentralize your choreography or your, your orchestration? Are you going to drop a BPM style product in here? Are you going to do something that's a bit of a hybrid? It looks like it's a BPM system, but you deploy it and it becomes a decentralized implementation. However you do it, the point is you're going to need it because you need something that weaves all this together. Outside of the build of your core domain, this is really the, the code to allow you to have access to the supporting domains in a way that helps you. And then you hit the big problem, just like you did for microservices. 
which is the data. Now you've got data all over the place. There's no easy way to understand what's happening. Every provider is essentially a black box with the data uh, encapsulated and hidden within the system. It turns out that putting data at the center of this kind of architecture is step one. Uh, you're going to need to capture things like event logs. You'll need a way to pull all that data in from other places, normalize it, clean it up, transform it, so that you can do the things that are valuable, like uh, getting reports, uh, creating audit reports for regulators, uh, and even be able being able to get some insight right, by having data that's useful. There are lots of different ways of doing this. But the key thing is we need those constraints. The constraint of the capability providers don't talk to each other. They talk to us so that we can start to capture interactions, message data, uh, and business data in a way that's useful for us. That might also involve not being the system of record or the store. It could be that this is just a view and I pull it when needed. But however you implement it, this thing has to be there. And it has to be really at the heart of whatever you build. And then the last challenge you face is that the whole thing is so complicated, it's, it's difficult to understand. So you're going to have to put something on top of it. Um, for us, of course, that means APIs. So we want to have APIs for the user experience and APIs for third parties to use this platform or for ecosystems to use it. The main thing we're trying to do is, is hide the complexity so that someone who's using this function doesn't need to know that there's 13 services that come from outside our organization, some microservices that weave it together in, in a data store. What they actually want to do is just onboard a customer. Beyond that, you're going to need consoles, ways for both businesses and, and tech to see what's happening. Uh, and this turns out to be a challenge. The, the lean version of this is you can point them to a distributed or decentralized set of consoles. Hey, if you're looking for CRM data, you'll have to log into the, the CRM console. And that can be a starting point. Uh, eventually, with more investment, you can start to create a single pane of glass. Uh, but that takes work. But then the last and most intriguing thing to me is to start changing the way we talk about service catalogs. Uh, if you think about it, when people say things like service registry and catalogs and management, they tend to think about a catalog of maybe APIs in the channel. These are the ones I can use to do something with your system. Or we think about uh, APIs inside, right? So from a registry perspective, all the ones in our enterprise. But what if the, the, the catalog was just services with some metadata about where it lives? So what we get is a view of APIs that we can build things with. And that includes the ones we own, the ones we use, and the ones we could use. Then you can start to really expand how you look at the world. Ultimately, the, the architecture I'm describing, that's a microservices architecture, right? But it's a microservices architecture that pretends that someone else's services are, are our own. And that's what I mean by borderless. I'm not saying there's no borders. I mean it in that same kind of way that uh, whoever started calling serverless, serverless. It's this perception, this point of view. How could you optimize a system where we try and build it in a way where we take advantage of other people's services? Right. So if that's interesting to you, these are the kinds of systems uh, we're building. So get in touch if, if this is something you feel like you need. Uh, and I'd be happy to talk to you and we can find out if we can help. Thanks. Hi, Ronnie. Thank you very much for, for that talk. Uh, we see some, some uh, comments and questions, right? So do you, are you saying that the future of growth or potential is about is on the consumer, not on the provider side anymore? I think we've talked about building and providing a lot. And of course, there's still potential there. What I'm saying is there's a new opportunity here that we should pay attention to. And it might mean that if classically your target market is not developers and you've done 
what you need from an API perspective, then there's an opportunity here to invest in something that would give returns. Is it a kind of a, a web of, let's say, uh, corporate APIs that we're that we're trying to implement? I think I think the description I I showed you here might be. Um, but essentially, it's still it's still a web of services, right? Now these turned out to be like services you have to pay for. What I can imagine though is if you start going down this road, what I hope is it could lead us to the kind of more open web of APIs that, that we imagine. Because what we need to do is start greasing this wheel so that there's actual uh, motivation, right? To create services that are easier to consume, easier to engage with, easier to onboard with, and easier to use. Yeah, that makes sense. But what do we need to go to the next step? Is it about standards? Is it about companies working together? I, I don't have an answer for that yet. I don't know. Uh, what I do know is there is a piece of work that's immediately in front of anyone who wants to engage with the system. And that piece of work is you know, hiding some of the, the things that are missing, filling in some of those gaps in interoperability. Where it goes from there, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it's a great uh, uh, vision that you share here. And a lot of people actually are trying to make APIs more discoverable and more integrable. Yeah. Uh, and yes, yeah, so they're trying to find a path to that uh, value proposition, but it's not easy. It's not easy, let's say, uh, like that. Absolutely. So it was very inspiring. Thank you, Ronnie, for all, all the right. work you went into it. And yes, yeah. and uh, yeah, have a good, uh, have a good, have a good one. Thanks, Benny.